Hi, this is Jason with Flash Fiction Friday. Today we got something a little different, uh, something special that I wanted to share. This is from a project that um, I'm working on with Chuck Workman, uh, my companion author. And then also, as you will hear, it's being read by the uh, illustrious Zach Bjorgi. Um, it was a project, a uh, fantasy project, that I started as a single novel, but we expanded it to include um, several other authors. It's going to be coming out late, uh, later this year from Immortal Works. Uh, enjoy uh, the first chapter of Valkoria Heroes of the Crystal Star. Chapter 1 Providence White. Everything around Citrel Traul was white. The blizzard made the Neneset River behind him and the line of infantry in front his only identifiable markers, and they were little more than ghostly shapes outlined by gray haze. He wondered how the engineers were able to accomplish something as delicate as the placing of hundreds of pounds of explosives while half-blind. It made him tense. Part of him anticipated a premature explosion with every breath, but everything remained hauntingly quiet. As an experiment, Citrell strained his hearing in an attempt to detect the engineers at work. Nothing. The compressed atmosphere caused by the storm made him feel as though he were not fifty miles south of civilization, waiting in the wild for an innumerable army to descend upon them, an army that would be fifty times the size of his small force of one thousand infantrymen and eight hundred light cavalry. We don't need to fight them all, his father's words echoed in his mind. The ice sheet over the river isn't thick enough to march an army across. That means all we have to do is make sure the engineers can explode the bridge so that General Dion's army will have time to reach Sail Nen. Citrell held on to that. If all went well, they may not even need to fight, though experience and his soldiers' training cautioned against such naive optimism. Citrell's horse stamped and wickered, a dual puff of steam exhaling from its nostrils. He shivered and pulled his cloak tight across his shoulders as though he were an old woman fighting a chill. Winter was worse in his home city to the north, but under the mistaken assumption that the climate would be warmer this far south, he failed to bring along thicker, warmer clothes. Someone at his right chuckled. <laughs> I seem to recall telling you to bring your fur-lined cloak when you left Salacia Tao. All of your high-priced tutors taught me that it was warmer the further south you traveled. Citrell clenched his jaw in order to keep his teeth from chattering. The man chuckled again. <laughs> Perhaps, but not for another three hundred miles. You might have brought it with you. Citrell shot a glance to his right. His father, Enot Traul, sat proudly on his white stallion, shoulders square and bearded jaw jutting resolutely from underneath his hood. He turned to look at Citrell. Then you would never learn. He said that with a mischievous glint in his eye. Learn what? Citrell scoffed. That your father is always right. Citrell attempted another scoff, but his trembling made it come out sounding like a sob. His father's smile faded. We could swap. Citrell suppressed another shiver as he shook his head, his shoulder-length hair catching on the interior of his hood. I will endure. I am certain your men won't notice if that is what you're worried about. No, Citrell snapped. It came out harsher than he intended. Very well, his father said patiently. I am sorry, father. I mean, general. Enot Traul was one of five chief generals in the Amagus army, and Citrell had long become accustomed to his father's military prominence. What he wasn't used to was serving directly under his father, something he hadn't needed to worry about before his promotion. In fact, the Amagus force waiting here on the enemy's side of the Nineset was his command, not his father's. It was only somewhat by happenstance that the two of them ended up serving together on this mission, though his father would claim it to be Providence. He saw every noteworthy coincidence as either divine providence or diabolical malevolence. Citrell had been running training exercises in the south city of Sail Nen with his new command when scouts returned with the news that an Caucasian army was massing in a city a short distance from their side of the border. 
The scouts estimated the number of troops flowing into Vendelale to be in the tens of thousands. That could mean only one thing. They were staging for an invasion. Citrell made certain that word was sent to the capital by rail, and in less than a week, his father arrived with several officers and a small battalion of infantry. That was a token force compared to the army that was even now marching for the river, but it would be another two weeks before General Dion's army of 50,000 arrived. Blowing up the massive stone causeway that bridged the mile-wide Neneset would delay the enemy's attack on the south city just long enough for them to fortify it against the inevitable siege. I'm sorry, Citrell said. The waiting is setting my teeth on edge. It is all right, Commander. For some reason, his father, using his new rank to address him, made him swell. It was more a compliment than an adherence to military decorum, a subtle way for him to express parental pride without embarrassing him in front of his men. His father was a very considerate man that way, something Citrell had only begun to appreciate recently. Shards of the crystal star, but I can't see a thing in this storm, Citrell grumbled. Take care what you say. He not Trowel whispered. Citrell felt ashamed for his blasphemy. Sorry, Fop, General. I just wish the Creator would have designed to bless us with better weather for the battle. He not Trowel shook his head. The storm is a blessing. It may curtail our ability to see, but it has also hidden us from the Occasion army. From somewhere ahead of them, a trumpet blew. Not anymore, Citrell said. The sound of hooves beating the ground behind them made Citrell turn in his saddle. A rider materialized out of the fog and drew rein so fast that his horse skidded to a stop in the wet snow. General! Commander! The soldier hastily threw salutes at each of them. Lieutenant Trebeer of the Engineering Corps reports their rigging is not finished. Well, how much longer will it take? Citrell demanded. At least two hours! Citrell looked to his father, and Enoch Trowell clenched his jaw. Tell Trippier that we can give him one. If he is not finished by then, then he is to pile the excess dynamite at the foot of the first arch and be ready to blow the bridge on my command. Yes, General! The man saluted, wheeled his horse, and disappeared back into the fog. Creator, shield us from the weapons of our enemies. Citrell's father prayed aloud before drawing a magnificent sword with a tapered blade and long silver crossguard. Do you think Kyan is with us? Citrell asked, and for a moment he was not a commander addressing his general, but a frightened son seeking reassurance from his father. We are, after all, in the very shadow of death. His father hesitated a long moment before turning to look at Citrell, and there was something different in his eyes. A softness that had belied his drawn sword, proud horse, and general's insignia. Yes, your brother is with us. Shouting, and the first volley of musket fire erupted from somewhere in front of them. To your squadrons! Enoch Trowell motioned indiscriminately to his left. Wait until the last line of musketeers fires the third volley before calling your charge. Citrell nodded, snapped the reins of his horse, and galloped away. As planned, he joined his three squadrons of cavalry lined up in an echelon formation on the left flank of the main body of Amagus infantry. He rode down the slanted line, drawing his sword and waving it over his head while shouting, ON MY COMMAND! He then wheeled his horse about so that his back was to his men, and he was facing the direction of their incoming enemy. A chorus of repeated cracks split the air. It was followed by another round of musket fire, this time louder. Finally, the last line of riflemen, of whom Citrell could only see his outlined shapes, stood, took aim, and fired. Charge! Citrell lowered his sword and pointed it forward. With a sound like a hundred thunderstorms, his three squadrons of riders, roughly four hundred in all, launched their horses into a gallop with Citrell leading the charge. Generally, they would start with a canter to maintain formation and then build up to full speed, but they needed to strike the enemy quickly. Sooner than Citrell expected, the fog pulled back to reveal a mass of men clad in leather jerkins, armed with muskets, and wearing hooded capes. They were arrayed in a column but were scrambling to form a musket line. 
the enemy had scarcely noticed the trail's cavalry when they crashed into them. Panicked shouts and cries of pain joined the din of hollered orders and musket fire as the trail squadron rode down stunned Occasion soldiers. They crossed into the enemy ranks at an angle, disrupting line formations and causing as much pandemonium as they could before swinging back in the direction of the river. While curving back, Citrell saw his next squadron perpetuate the chaos he'd caused, driving even further into the enemy column. And when his third squadron struck, the front of the Occasion column was in full retreat. Citrell's squadron began to cheer, and he let them enjoy a moment of victory before reining it in with a stern reminder that their battle was only just beginning. They continued the hit-and-run tactic and were able to strike twice more before the enemy began to regroup. The blizzard had dwindled to a lazy snowfall, and the sky cleared, rapidly improving battlefield visibility and giving Citrell his first real look at a column of enemy troops that stretched back beyond his sight. The whiteout had made their surprise strike much more effective than it otherwise would have been, and now it was clearing just when they needed it to. His father was right. The creator was in the storm. A boom made Citrell start, and for a moment, he wondered if the engineers had blown the bridge early. But screaming close by and a rain of dirt and snow indicated something else. He looked to where his infantry was arrayed. The three long lines of musketeers down on one knee at the front. They were shouting, and why had they stopped firing? A second boom sounded as something black, little more than a blur, streaked down out of the sky and into the main body of his men. An explosion followed, sending up dirt, snow, and body parts. Cannons! Citrell shouted. With the fog and element of surprise, the Occasion soldiers shouldn't be able to set up their cannons this quickly. Nor had he expected they'd be transporting them this close to the front of the column. And since when had the enemy started using explosive mortar? As far as Citrell knew, the Occasion Empire didn't have that technology. The miscalculation was catastrophic, and he watched in impotent horror as shell after shell rained down on his men, their lines breaking as they scrambled in all directions. Commander! A faraway voice called. Commander! He repeated. Citrell! He felt a hand on his shoulder shaking him. He looked up to find his father standing up in his stirrups and staring into his face. Father, Citrell said numbly. I've sounded the retreat. When had the trumpet blown? I need you to lead the foot soldiers back across the river. I will take all six squadrons of cavalry and cover your retreat. Citrell nodded, his father's decisive orders bringing him back to the moment. The very moment the last of our cavalry ride across, have Trebir blow the bridge, ready or not, understand. Citrell nodded sharply. His father turned away, but Citrell shot out a hand and caught him by the arm. His father looked back, surprise and irritation both showing on his bearded face. But before he could reprimand him, Citrell said, Cayenne is with us. I know it. His father's expression softened, and he flashed a smile at Citrell. Then he wheeled his horse and rode away, shouting for Citrell's cavalry to rally to him. Citrell turned and began riding through the mass of Amagus soldiers scrambling about in confusion. He quickly found their captain and shouted, Elir! The man looked up just as Citrell rode over to him. Get your men in order. We are warriors of the White Eagle, not a group of frightened milkmaids. Captain Elir saluted and began to shout orders. Another mortar screamed down from the sky and exploded not but a hundred feet from Citrell. Fortunately, it didn't strike any soldiers directly, but several men cried out as they were hit by hard bits of frozen ground and sharp shards of ice. The explosion so close to him had the unexpected benefit of calling the army's attention in his direction, so Citrell used it and raised his sword, shouting, To me! Captain Aelir's men responded, and soon Citrell was shepherding the foot soldiers across the wide stone bridge to the other side of the river. Not that the enemy couldn't fire muskets or launch mortar across the Neneset, but they wouldn't be able to pursue them as they fled to a safe distance. Citrell looked behind him, past the long line of fleeing infantry, to where 800 horsemen wove in and out of the enemy ranks, harrying them and drawing their cannon fire. Please protect Father Kyan, 
sprint. It took a painstakingly long time for Citrell's footmen, even at full sprint, to cross the bridge. But eventually, the last booted foot fell onto the snow-packed ground on the opposite side of the river. Having been riding at the army's rear, Citrell was the last to cross. A flash of gold drew his gaze to Lieutenant Trebeer, and he snapped the reins of his horse, leaping to the ground at his side before the mount had come to a halt. Commander Traoul! Trebeer saluted. Sound the trumpet to call back our cavalry, and then blow the bridge once they're across, he ordered. We aren't ready, sir, Trebeer said, raising his hands. The enemy has exploding mortars, or didn't you see that? Citrell snapped. We are out of time! The engineer nodded and did as commanded, the sound of a trumpet blasting a heartbeat later. Elir! Citrell called. Yes, Commander! The man pushed through a group of panting soldiers and jogged up to him. The enemy can still hit us from their side of the Neneset. He waved in the opposite direction of the bridge. Get these men a mile away from here before you let them rest. Yes, sir! Elir saluted before turning and barking a series of curt and reprimanding orders. Watching the slow disengagement of the cavalry from the enemy was agonizing, but Citrell suppressed his urge to mount up and ride back across the bridge to join his father. It would do no good, but he had to reconvince himself of that whenever he saw or heard a shell explode. He flinched as one whistled out of the sky and buried itself on his side of the river in an explosion of dirt and snow. How are they moving the cannons up so quickly? Citrell's country used lighter alloys and rubber-encased wheels to move their cannons faster across the battlefield. The intelligence Citrell's father brought with him suggested that their enemy was ten years behind in cannon design. How had they made such a sudden technological leap? Did Amagus have a traitor placed among the leading ranks of the army? Citrell couldn't believe that. The enmity between the Amagus and Caucasian nations ran too deep for such collusion to be a serious possibility. The first squad of cavalry reached the bridge, but his father wasn't with them. Creator said that he hasn't fallen. Citrell prayed silently. As soon as the first squadron was across the bridge, he found their captain. Where is the general? he demanded, but the soldier didn't know. Citrell went back to staring across the river. Four more squadrons crossed, and there was still no sign of his father. His heart beat faster, and his praying intensified. I know you're here, Kyan. Protect him, please. Mother nearly broke when we lost you, and she will break for certain if we lose father. He left out that Kyan's death had broken him, too, and that it was only by his father's persistent ministrations that he'd been put back together. Finally, the last squadron rode their horses onto the bridge. Citrell's stomach twisted and his mouth dried when he realized that their number was half of what it originally had been. This time, Citrell couldn't restrain himself. He leapt onto his horse and galloped onto the bridge, determined to press his way through the retreating cavalry and ride back across the river. That's when he saw his father riding his white stallion at the rear of the squadron. The relief in his chest unleashed a shout from deep within his throat. Father! Praise the Creator and thank you, Kyan! Enot Traoul spotted him and slashed to the empty air in front of him with his elegant sword. Back! he commanded. Citrell dutifully obeyed, but stayed on his horse near the front of the bridge as the last squadron poured onto the riverbank. Trebeer! Status! he shouted over his shoulder to the engineer. The man was uncoiling a long spool of copper wire as he hurriedly backed away from the bridge. Fifty feet away, one of Trebeer's assistants held a black box topped with a T-shaped plunger. As soon as Trebeer reached his assistant, the two would connect the box to the copper wire, and they would be ready to blow the bridge. Two minutes, Commander! Trebeer shouted back. Citrell nodded to himself and was about to reprimand the man for not being quicker when he heard a loud whistling sound. He looked back over the river and saw a shell falling out of the sky toward the bridge. Father! Citrell screamed. Enot Traoul didn't glance up, but Citrell knew he must have heard the incoming mortar, for his father furiously spurred his already galloping mount, impelling it to even greater speed. 
the shell crashed into the center of the bridge directly in front of his father. Citrell braced himself for an explosion, but none came. The round black ball rolled to its side in the small depression it made. Providence. Thank you, Kyan, he whispered before casting a glance back at Drabir and shouting, On my command! Whether the man responded, Citrell couldn't hear, not over the pounding of the blood in his ears, but he knew Trebir would be ready. Inat Traul's horse leapt over the cannonball, its hooves sliding to the side as it landed on the wet stone. Increasingly stronger waves of relief washed over Citrell in time with the approaching gallops of his father's horse. The mortar exploded. Citrell saw everything as if time slowed. The cannonball erupted in a flash of fire and smoke, sending chunks of the bridge into the air. A heartbeat later, the dynamite stuffed into holes drilled into the stone all along the bridge reacted. A blast of heat assaulted Citrell along with sharp bits of stone. One grazed his cheek, the pain bringing him back into real time. Rapid, overlapping explosions tore through the bridge, sending up smoke and debris so thick that Citrell was blinded. When the dynamite under the bridge's first foot went off, Citrell was thrown from his horse. Sound faded to a distant thing, and Citrell fought to stay conscious. He'd hit his head hard, and the concussion muddled his thinking. Thought became slippery, and for a moment, he wondered where he was. Then, as if in deliberate metaphorical timing, Citrell's wits returned in tandem with the clearing smoke. Father! he shouted as he scrambled up. Why was it so difficult to stand? Sound returned and Citrell froze as he caught sight of the bridge, or rather the absence of it. Only leaning stone arches peeked out from under the broken ice of the river's surface. Nothing of the actual bridge, not even the abutments, remained. Hands grabbed him from behind and dragged him away from the river as another shell fell somewhere nearby. He was numb. He couldn't think. Citrell closed his eyes and let himself be carried away. The pain in his head and leg was nothing to him. Blood ran into his right eye, but even that didn't bother him. There would be no pain if he could just stay like this. Numb. <laughs>